All right, well, in this video, we're gonna take a look at the biblical context of ancient art. I think it's important that when you're studying ancient Mediterranean art, you realize all of the connections that can be made to the Bible. So often when we read the Bible, we do so with, with modern Western eyes. But if you really want to be able to properly interpret the scriptures, you need to be sensitive to its cultural framework. And the cool thing about studying ancient art is that it helps provide some of those, those social and cultural contexts for the Old and New Testament. Now, I know some people claim that the biblical text is like other ancient religious texts, and they say all of that is just a bunch of ancient myths. And you know, it would be a real problem if none of the people or the places in the Bible ever existed. But the fact is, over the last 200 years, Archaeologists have uncovered a vast amount of evidence confirming the existence of all these people in the Bible. Uh, they've also located the locations and these places of all the people in the Bible and have been able to determine and locate all of the major biblical cities uh, and geographical features that are described in the Bible. The archaeologist William Albright once stated, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of the Old Testament tradition. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, so, so I'm going to be going through a few works that are discussed in the text and demonstrate how they correspond with the biblical text and the stories that many of you are familiar with from the Bible. All right, I'm going to start off with the Ziggurat of Ur. The Ziggurat of Ur is a really good example of what many scholars think that the historic Tower of Babel looked like. I don't know about you, but when I was little, I used to think the Tower of Babel looked more like the Tower of Pisa. But because the biblical text places the story in Mesopotamian region, and because the account in Genesis 11 corresponds with the materials and the process used when making these ziggurats, uh, the ziggurat is really the best imagery to, to reference in this story. Back then, the ziggurat was the Mesopotamian temple. Uh, it was their most sacred space. They considered it their primary connection between heaven and earth. So keep that in mind next time you read through the Genesis account. As you get further into the Old Testament, you may start reading about the Assyrians. And that's because the Assyrians were the major ancient superpower of their day, and they were a constant thorn in the Israel side. And Old Testament prophets like Amos and Hosea, they went to warn the people uh, to repent or else they would be destroyed. And if you recall, the Assyrians were the ones who conquered the northern kingdom of Israel uh, back in 722 BC. This is a sculpture of their protective deity. Uh, it's called the Lamassu. Uh, these things were really intimidating, and so were the Assyrians. Um, in fact, the Assyrians were known for, for sticking decapitated heads on poles and marching around with these poles. They would also take the skins off the bodies of their enemies and spread them over their tents. I mean, disgusting. And so you would have definitely seen a Lamassu if you would have headed into Assyrian territory. Um, and speaking of which, do you know what the capital of Assyria was in ancient times? Nineveh. That's right. <laughs> the place where the prophet Jonah didn't want to go and refused to go because he didn't want God to extend his mercy to the Assyrians. Um, and I can't th help but think about Jonah and God's mercy when I look at this enormous ancient sculpture. This is another Assyrian work called the Lion Hunt. And uh, back then, lions were symbols of the, the violence of nature, and the king had this tradition where he, he would stage these, these large lion hunts in this kind of big protected arena, and only the king was allowed to go out and kill these, these lions. Uh, seeing this kind of sculptural freeze of this event, it really shows how the defeat of the lion symbolized the king's power and the authority over nature and over his people. When I look at this, I can't help but to think about Daniel, who was living within a hundred years of this sculptural freeze. Um, and, and this is important because it awakens us to the symbolism and the significance of God closing the mouths of the lions and allowing Daniel to emerge without a scratch. 
I mean, the power and authority tied to the defeat of lions, it, it may be the reason why King Darius worships God immediately after this event in the story. Speaking of Daniel, I wanted to flash up another image from your text. Uh, this is the, the Ishtar Gate, which would have been one of the gates leading into this ancient city of Babylon. Uh, now, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians and were another major superpower of their day. Most of the Old Testament prophets that you read about in the Bible were warning Judah that they would be taken out if they didn't repent. And so in 587, the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem and they began this two year siege on Jerusalem and utterly destroyed the temple and just ravished the whole city. And they actually, at this time, the Babylonians decided to deport a number of the Israelites into Babylon, uh, thus starting the Babylonian captivity. So when I see this image, I think about all the Israelites that were taken from Jerusalem and, and brought here to the city of Babylon in their time of captivity. Several years ago, I took a group of students and parents to Chicago, and one of the museums that we visited was the Oriental Museum, which has a fantastic uh, collection of ancient Near East art. And one of the works that we saw was a part of this Babylonian wall that had led up to the Ishtar Gate. And and I'll never forget when I explained to the group that, you know, Daniel, people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have walked by this work, you know, some of the people just started tearing up. And, you know, it's incredible to be able to see works like this in person and, and to know that the heroes of the faith, which we respect and have come um, to, to just really look up to, they have a historical place in archaeological history. And, and so that's one of the exciting things about being able to study these ancient art artifacts. Well, after the Babylonian and Assyrian empires, then came the Persian Empire. And they were known for having these huge banquet halls filled with columns that were topped with these heads of bulls. And I remember when one of my students was taking a picture with this colossal bull head, I reminded them that Queen Esther would have seen something just like this. In fact, Esther's husband, King Xerxes, was a major player in the Greco-Persian and wars. Speaking of the Greeks, I wanted to flash up this image of the Acropolis. Uh, and although the Apostle Paul came to Athens long after the construction of the Acropolis and the Parthenon, uh, the sermon he gave on Mars Hill is right there. And you can see how he, this hill overlooks the entire Acropolis. Uh, so this is where he found the altar that was, that was dedicated to the unknown God and how he was able to survey all of the objects that they worshipped. So, pretty interesting. I wanted to look lastly at Rome. And of course, here in Rome, there's just a plethora of sites that pertain to the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, and the early church. And I've got up here an image of the Colosseum, which many claim to be a place where the early Christians were martyred because of their faith. Now, it's, it's, when you think about the early Christian and the persecution that went on, I mean, it's really horrifying to, to think about what they went through um, for their faith. Um, I, I'm thinking particularly about the time of Nero. Um, during his reign, he was known for, for having Christians being covered in tar, and then they would light them on fire to light up the streets at night. And it's crazy to think of what they went through back then. And, I, and I'm not messing around. They were so convinced that they had seen the risen Savior, that they were willing to, to suffer, to go through so much persecution just for their faith. And although people think about places like the Colosseum for, for Christian execution, it was actually places like the Circus Maximus or the Circus Nero that these executions took place. Uh, 
In fact, it was at the Circus Nero where Peter was said to have been buried. Uh, and there was actually a tomb marker there for, for several years, for a long period of time. And in the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine decided to construct the first huge Christian church right there at the historic site of where Peter was supposedly buried there at that tomb marker. And so the, the church, as you may know, was co called St. Peter's. And it is, its location is what we now know to be the Vatican City. Um, supposedly the tomb is located directly underneath um, the high altar in a crypt underground. And I actually spoke to a Roman, um, a Roman priest who had seen with his own eyes the tomb. So um, I've never seen it and unfortunately they don't let tourists go down there, but that's, that's what I've heard. All right, well, that provides a little context, both into the artistic works that we've been studying, as well as the biblical accounts that you're familiar with. And uh, hopefully you can see how studying these ancient works and their cultural framework, how that can really enhance your understanding of scriptures and allow you to interpret scriptures within their proper context. All right, well, all for now. Catch you next time.